Hi, this is Bob Sorrentino from Italian Roots and Genealogy, and I'm here today with Steve Williams, and we're going to talk about his family and his research. So welcome, Steve. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Uh, so, you know, when and, and why did you get started researching your family? Well, I think, you know, I was always like a, a little bit of an odd duck in, uh, in terms of family. My name is Williams. So, you know, if you look at me, you say, well, this guy is like Norwegian or something. You know, he's not Italian. I don't look Italian. My last name is William. So, you know, me and my dad. So my dad met my mother in uh, New York Harbor after World War II. He was set up with her by some of uh, his Navy, Navy buddies who lived in New Jersey. So he met my mother in New York Harbor. He's from the state of Washington met her and got married and i think he went back like once and that you know that was it so uh so then they moved in with my grandparents uh, who were both on my you know my mother's parents uh who were both born in italy came over like in the uh 1905 you know sort of tur turn of the century so uh i became interested because the only family that I that I ever knew growing up in New Jersey were Italian people, and they all had names like Tony and Uncle Frank and Vito, and you know I'm like Stefan, like Stephen, like where did that you know where did that come from? And then also I was an only child, so apparently my mother had some difficulties with the birth and. So I was an only child. So then, and, and you know, my my father died when he was like sixty eight. Uh, then my mother died shortly after. So I basically became like, um, you know, sort of like a, a, a ship adrift at sea. Like I didn't, you know, I was out of touch with my Italian cousins. Uh, they were very in touch when my grandmother was alive, and then everything just every generation it just kind of. Mm -hmm. fell apart to the point where I don't have much contact with them. So I really, uh, being that only child and now my parents are dead, I wanted to really sort of connect with, uh, you know, my roots. And uh, so I became heavily steeped in genealogy and I've been doing genealogy for probably 30, 35 years. Uh, some of the work was done you know, by me, you know, going out to Salt Lake City and and then I've probably hired five or six genealogists, you know, professional genealogists over the years, including uh, a guy in Avellino, Italy, by the name of Joe uh, De Simone, who helped me with some of my Italian roots. So that that's how I got interested. And uh, but, you know, amazingly enough, as a kid, uh, I was curious and I was much more curious then my parents, like my parents knew, <laughs> they knew like nothing about, you know, if you, you know, they might know like who their grandmother was, but that's like it, you know, and, um, uh, you know, so I actually asked my grandfather and my grandmother when I was maybe, uh, maybe 10 years old, I said, so I know you were born in Italy, like, you know, where in Italy were you, you were born in? So I actually got like the first hand, you know, from their lips. And my grandmother, fortunately, actually even told me the village. So that made it, you know, like a little bit easier. But I didn't do anything, you know, from 10 years on, 10 years on, probably in my 30s, I started getting more involved in the, you know, actual research. Yeah, so that's still, that's, that's a very, very long time ago. I mean, I, I was a big history you know, buff. So, you know, I, and I guess I really started in earnest, maybe, you know, 15 years ago or something like that. But to start 30, 35 years ago, that's a long time. And, and I wish I wish I had asked the grandparents, you know, and anybody that I talk to now ask me, where do I start? I say, go ask grandma, you know, yeah, because right. that's that's the place that that's the place to start. Yeah. So so um, so where is uh, where is your mom's family from? All right, so mom's family, which is the one I have the most interest in, I made a, basically made a pledge that I would go back and see that village. So she, she is from uh, the province of Naples, a city called Caserta. Mm -hmm. So Caserta is where the Reggie is, the palace. And then she told me actually the village, and the village is Turo, 
T-U-O-R-O. So Toro is like a subset of uh, a fra- fra- frazione, I guess they call it, of, uh, of Caserta. And uh, small, small, tiny place, you know. And uh, that kind of leads me to, you know, one of my first stories here because, you know, my name is Stephen with a PH. So it reads like Stephen. So I said to my mother, and this was several times when she was alive, I said, Mom, like, how did you get the name Stephen? Like, where, where in God's <laughs> name did that come from? So she said it was your grandmother. So her mother's mother, who was a Teresina D'Amico, and she married um, Andrea Verdicchio. So the family name back there was uh, Verdicchio. And um, so um, I, I asked her, you know, she said, so your grandmother, your great grandmother wanted you to name that name. So um, and I said, why? And she says, I don't know. I mean, you would think <laughs> like, well, wouldn't you wouldn't you ask her why? And, you know, you know again, it's sort of a lack of curiosity, but. You know, these are people who went through the wars, they went through the Depression. So, you know, they were more focused on making ends meet, not, you know, doing a genealogy study, right? So, uh, but uh, when I went back to, I, so I visited uh, Turo and I actually made contact with, you know, distant cousins, ancient cousins that still live in that village that have an unbroken line in that village and their last name, my grandmother's maiden name of uh, Verdicchio. So uh, I visited Turo with my cousin Alessandro and it's a teeny tiny place. I mean, it's the village is like, maybe it's, I don't even think it's a square mile. I, I don't know how, how big it is, but maybe 500 houses, something like this. So there's one church in the entire village, and that church is San Stefano. Ah, so that was that was my answer. Why was she so fixated? And and uh, uh, so I have a lot more to tell about that encounter. Yeah. So that well, that's an interesting story. Interesting story about how you get the name because I was sure you were going to say it was you know the grandparent or something, which is. The way it usually is but i guess they wanted to have that tie back or your, your great grandmother wanted yeah. to have that tie back to the village yeah. right so yeah so that's yeah. that's that's a, an interesting story so so you go there with your cousin now and you're finding which it's amazing to sit, find that you still have you know relatives there in these because a lot of the small towns dissipated and there's you know yeah a tenth of the people so, that used to be there yeah, so I, I spoke with this. So Joe De Simone, he's a genealogist. He's in Avellino, did some nice work for me. And most of the work uh, in terms of putting the pieces together for me came from the churches. And Joe said to me, he said, Steve, the municipalities are completely uncooperative. Like they, they just they don't want to be bothered, you know, but the churches you know, maybe he made a donation. I don't know. But he said the churches are like relatively cooperative. So I said to him, Joe, I said, I, you know, I told him a story about these people. And um, I actually I actually found Alessandro through just Googling, you know, Turo, uh, mm-hmm. Verdicchio, the name. And then he was like a real estate agent in the town. He's a young man. He's in his 30s. So we started corresponding for probably three or four years at first i'm sure his family thought i was you know uh, a nut you know from america some <laughs> kind of scam artist you know and but then i started sending them photos and telling them the story and um and actually the funny thing is like one of his brothers alberto actually looks a lot like my uncle jimmy i mean it's they could be doubles i mean it's really uh really amazing But I said to Joe uh, DeSimone, I said, Joe, so could you actually tie down for me how I'm related to these people? And he said, Steve, he goes, yes, I could do that. But he said, the relationship is probably, you know, three or four generations back. You're talking, you know, 150 years. All these people had like eight, nine, 10 kids. They all had the same names you know, Carmela, Anthony, Francesco, I mean, they all have the same names. He goes, it's going to cost you a lot of money for me to pinpoint who it is. 
He goes, but I can tell you this. If they're telling you that they lived in Turo with an unbroken line as far back as they can remember, these are your cousins. You know, mm-hmm. we just don't, and it's really unimportant, like, you know, who the, who the common ancestor was. So, and uh, Joe through the church was able to uh, trace my Verdicchio ancestry in Turo back to like the early 1700s. So, and I have the succession of, of people, you know, uh, after that. So, uh, but going there and particularly visiting the church was really an incredible experience. I mean, it was just uh, mind boggling. And um, my cousin, Alessandro, he speaks very good English. And he wanted to, uh, he wanted to uh, me to go in the church and meet the, the priest and get as much information I had. And he was actually like a little aggressive. He's like knocking on the door, <laughs> knocking on the door. You know, finally I see, I was waiting in the background. Finally, I see this priest come out. The priest is a young guy like him, you know, in his thirties, they're pointing over to me, you know, uh, crazy. So finally the priest says, okay, come in. So I go in, we sit down with the priest uh, in his office and and Alessandro's trying to get like, he wants to go through like all the books and do research. And I said, Alessandro, I have all this information already. I have everything. So we don't need to bother the, the priest with this. So anyway, but the church is uh, over a thousand years old and it, it's been added onto, but like the original mm. building is over a thousand years old. And if you look at the side of the church on one of the walls they have the names of all the uh uh many of my relatives but the people who died in world war one and world war two the names are on the side of the church and they're all names that i recognize whether these were verdicchio people or ronchella which was another name that married into the family and so i'm seeing all these names it's really incredible i had such a an extensive family in this little village and uh, the priest said to me, um, you know, uh, uh, this is, you know, where your family comes from. So this is a really uh, amazing story that I'm going to tell you now. So I'm sitting in front of the priest and I look up to the right on this adjacent wall and he has a, a, a cross, a crucifix. And it's unlike any crucifix that you would typically see there's no body of christ on the crucifix it's just like an inlaid crucifix as a matter of fact maybe i can th- this is actually the the crucifix here so you can see looking at this it's very unusual right mm-hmm. i mean it's, yeah it's like gold leaf it's got you know all this like inlay in it um so i had bought this uh crucifix in italy when we were in venice several years ago and i think it was made it was made in no no i bought it in amalfi but i think it was made in the murano uh, factory so now we're very far away from where i bought this church like uh, where i bought the crucifix like hundreds of miles away in this little church in the middle of nowhere so and this is the only crucifix that i have in my entire house hanging up in my dining room. So I look up at that wall on the right-hand side. He has the identical crucifix, Mm -hmm. not similar, identical. I took a photo of it, all the colors, everything. So I told the priest the story and, you know, tears came to my eyes because I thought this was really a incredible coincidence. And this is one in millions or billions. I mean, this is crazy. So the priest, without without uh, missing a beat, he said to me, he goes, of course. He goes, who do you think brought you here? Why mm. do you think you're here? He goes, God brought you here, and he's just giving you a sign. And that was such a meaningful experience for me. Wow, that's, that, yeah, you know, and, and I say this all the time. I, I've, I've interviewed a lot of people, and... One person in particular who, you know, is, is, I guess, like a, you know, a psychic type of person or something like that. And, you know, I'm convinced that they want to be found, you know, the ancestors want to be yeah. found. And, and there are these, 
you know, these subtle clues that, or things that happen that just aren't coincidence, you know? Right. But that's yeah. something, I mean, that's, that's, a, I haven't heard something that profound, you know, that you had, you bought this cross years before and then you get there and the same cross is there. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's amazing. And for him yeah. to say that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So then he, so I told him, I said, look, my Verdicchio ancestors go back to the early 1700s. And that's what we could find. So, I mean, they may even go back. Mm -hmm. Who knows? I mean, they may have lived in this place for like a thousand years. I mean, who knows? But the earliest one was a uh, Pasquale. He was born in like the 1720s or something. So anyway, the priest grabs me. He takes me into the the church in the baptismal area so there's a baptismal font this baptismal font probably weighs like i don't know four thousand pounds i mean it was carved <laughs> it was carved from like a solid block of marble i mean this freak this thing is huge it must be five feet high or four you know, probably four feet high and then the basin is probably 42 inches across. I mean, it's, it's freaking huge. So he goes, look at the bottom. And the bottom has got the date that's carved in the baptismal font. And it was like 1452 or something like that. This is like 600 years old, this thing. He goes, this is where Pasquale was baptized 300 years ago. This is where your great grandmother was baptized. This is where your grandmother was baptized. All of these people in your your family history, they were all married here. And it was just really just crazy. And uh, there's a there's a bench outside the church. And the bench is like solid stone. I don't know if it's granite or marble. I don't know what it is, but uh, it has a depression in it from people sitting on it. So <laughs> the stone must the stone must have been there for several hundred years. And it's all the middle of it is all depressed from people sitting on it. But this must be a bench that my ancestors sat on, you know, 300 years ago. I mean, it's sure. got to be the same one. And the priest showed us this bench and he goes, yeah, he goes, look at this. You know, he was very cordial and I made a nice donation to the church and uh, I actually think at some point I'd like to take my granddaughter and my grandson and have them, you know, rebaptized, you know, in, in this, this church. Um, so it was really uh, an amazing, amazing experience, uh, you know, with that, with that church. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. So now did you, did you, were you able to connect with, you know, other cousins there? that that I... well um yes so in other words they introduced me to other people they introduced me to their parents so this would be like so alessandro's parents are my age mm -hmm. uh so then they introduced me to the parents you know alessandro's grandparents and other cousins and we went out to dinner and uh, yeah, it was really kind of neat. But you know what's amazing is the many of these Italian people of our generation, Bob. They they don't speak English, right. but the the newer kids do. So you know, my son's age, you know, they speak English, but the people our age or older forget about it. I mean, they they speak less English than I speak Italian. But um, I hear from I am more in touch with this branch of the family than any other branch of my family. And we use what's WhatsApp and they're um, constantly getting messages. We're sending pictures back and forth on like Christmas. They called me up. We do like a FaceTime kind of thing on WhatsApp. And, you know, they really have that warm Italian family, you know, feeling where it's very important that they keep the ties with me. They actually visited me, um, Alessandra's younger brother, Valerio, visited me in America. And then, of course, I visited them, you know, the one time, but I want to, you know, I want to go back. They still live, they live uh, near Toro. They 
they moved, so they're in some other village. It's not Toro, but it's you know two minutes away. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, really so nice. that, did, did they know that they had any relatives in America? Uh, yes, they yeah they had knowledge that part of the family moved to America, but you know it was several generations removed from them, and they didn't really know exactly who it was and. This was a big uh, family, you know, and they uh, mm -hmm. they came over through Ellis Island and they settled in Hoboken and Jersey City, which is where I'm from. And the same thing with my grandfather, they settled in Hoboken and Jersey City. And but they did they did know that the people that went over to America settled in New Jersey and Hoboken in particular. So they did know that. So um so I think the common ancestor is um, uh, probably like um, like sort of like a great great grandfather to me would be the you know it's probably around the thing. But well, I tried to figure it out myself from the information they gave me. But there's there's just too many people. They all have ten, twelve kids. <laughs> they all use the same name. I know They're that's the, the hardest thing. Names. Yeah, I mean it's. It's so hard to find, you know, and there's there's not a lot of specificity in the records, you know, so it becomes, you know, it becomes like a, a Sherlock Holmes game, game uh, thing to try to figure out match. OK, it's birthday, uh, you know, uh, what's the mother's name? You know, it's, it's very hard to, to figure it out. But I I said to him, look, it, it doesn't matter. We don't need to trace this back. We, we know we're cousins and. Uh, yeah. I told them to, to get the ancestry DNA uh, done, but uh, to, to date they haven't done that. Yeah, I'm. I'm trying. We were supposed to go a couple. We had to cancel twice already, but I'm going next. I'm going next spring. I don't care what's going on, but yeah. I want to bring a few kits with me to give to some of my cousins there. And I and I yeah. did the same thing you did with with my uh, my, my dad's mother. Uh, I just went on, you know, I went on Facebook and I just started looking. Her, her name's not very common. It's Pierre Malo. And so there's only one family with that name. And, you know, I, I got a hit with one person, Jincia, who's been really like fabulous. She doesn't speak English. So same thing, you know, I cut and paste that of Google Translate and, and things like that. Um, but she, she started a group on Facebook thinking that she was going to find either Spain, where the family's originally from, you know, 400, 500 years ago, or yes. South America. She had no idea that there were anybody in the family from America. And in fact, there were only two, my grandmother and her aunt. Uh, so when we made the connection, it was just incredible. And, and you know, just, I mean, I've been more, I've been doing this with this family, I don't know how many, eight, 10 years, whatever it is. And I was just finally with her help, able to piece together uh, and found a second cousin. And wow. what's crazy about this, now these two families, you know, one family's in America, my, you know, my grandmother's in America, his family's in Italy. My great grandfather's name was Nicola. Okay. So my, my father was the second son. So he was named Nicholas after his maternal grandfather. Right. Um, his grandfather uh was the same generation as my father three years apart born three years apart he was nicola okay his name is roberto my name's robert right he, ha he has a son nicola and i have a daughter nicole and my sister has a son nicholas so yeah you know again you, you know Funny. coincidence probably but yeah. it's just, just it's, that's a really weird coincidence that all, each generation yeah. going down has the same names, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and it and was- my daughter, my daughter's Nicole. <laughs> ah, there you go, there you go. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, but it was just, it was just so weird to find that. And I had no idea when I started all this thing that I would ever find anybody as close as a second cousin in Italy. So, Hopefully, when we get there, we'll be we'll we'll be able to meet and everything. So now I have to ask you now: Have you have you done research on your father's side? Yes, I I have. Um, 
Well, let me tell you a little bit about my grandfather. So this would be this would be the other guy that came from Italy. So this mm -hmm. would be this would be Anna Verdicchio's husband. So this is my this is the Italian half of the equation. The people that I lived with, that I grew up with, they we lived in the same house. So he um, he came back from World War One. His name was Antonio Fontano. And he came back from World War One, and he was injured in the war. He was in the trench warfare in the Argonne Forest of France. He was gassed, you know, with the wow. mustard gas. Yeah, yeah. And my grandmother was a Red Cross nurse, so that's like kind of how they met. So you know, they lived uh, downstairs from us. So I obviously had you know daily interaction with them. But my grandfather you know, was really so traumatized from the war. I mean, he was really, uh, it's hard for him to breathe, but even despite the breathing issues with the mustard gas, what it did to his lungs, he worked like a mule. You know, if he couldn't get his car started, he would walk to work, you know, like 15 miles, you know, this, mm. is, the way these, this is the way these people were. Right. Uh, but amazingly, Again, as a kid, I asked him where he was from in Italy. And then when I did the genealogy, I found like his draft cards and his discharge papers and all that stuff. So he was born in a place called Palomonte. And Palomonte, nobody knows where that's from. You may think you've heard of it, but it's a, it's a tiny little village in Italy. So if you looked at Sorrento, People know where Sorrento mm -hmm. is. So it would be maybe 30 miles uh, east of Sorrento. So it's kind of like in the middle of the boot in southern Italy, uh, same like latitude as Sorrento. So I hired a car to go to this Palamonte, and it was all dirt roads. I mean, it was hard. It was difficult to even get into the village because it was all dirt roads, and they, they had earthquakes a few years ago and things were like really messed up. But uh, the one thing that um, some of these Fontano people like my cousins and stuff uh, told me was they said the name is really not Fontano, it's Fontana. Mm -hmm. And so he changed it, I guess, to be more of the masculine valve at the end or, you know, some who knows what the reason right. was. Yeah, again, you would think somebody would ask him because they had these suspicions, you know, way back when, like, why wouldn't you ask him? But I guess if you knew my grandfather, that may answer itself because he was a uh, he was a pretty tough cookie, you know, and he, he didn't <laughs> he didn't engage in a lot of small talk. But uh, anyway, so I go to Palamonte. I'm there in Palamonte. So I'm seeing like all these ancient churches where I'm sure like he was baptized. And there actually is a, um, a section in Palamonte called Fontana. So it's like a neighborhood. So mm, wow. that's got to be, you know, those people. And I had my driver go out. There was some guys in the neighborhood that looked like they lived there, but they were men that were in their late 70s, 80s. You know, these were old, old older people. And so... The guy comes, the driver comes back in the car. He goes, yes, I spoke with them. And they said, yes, there was a Fontana family living in here. They did a little farming. He goes, the whole family left, you know, around the turn of the century. So, uh, but that's about all I have. Uh, you know, I didn't, wasn't able to connect with any people. There are no Fontanas living in Pal Palamonte. Currently, there's only... I think there's maybe 300 people living there, very tiny village. And, um, but I'm still in touch with, um, with my grandfather's brother's son, who's a little bit older than me. So we've, we've compared notes. Um, so that's the story on my grandfather, but they all came through Ellis Island. They all settled in Hoboken and they all settled in, um, you know, in the area. Now my father, uh, my father, of course, is Anglo, you know, mm -hmm. and I, ha I, have ex I have more information on my dad than I do on the Italian side because these people, um, they, you know, they were in America for many, many years. 
So if you trace my dad and just go back in a direct line, the people that came over, they came over from Wales. Their name was Williams. They came over in like the mid 1700s. And the son of the guy who came over was an Edward John Williams, and he fought in the Revolutionary War. And he was one of the early settlers of uh, Kentucky. And he had members of his family kidnapped by Indians. Yeah, I've heard that before, but from somebody else, yeah. Yeah, so he got like his buddies together and they found like this Indian camp and they, you know, people were killed and they got, I think he got his wife back, but the son was killed. And the reason I know this is because when you tap into someone who fought in the Revolutionary War, chances are there are other people that are following this guy yeah. and they, they've appended like newspaper articles and stuff to the records. So that's kind of how I know this. The other interesting story with this guy is his older brother was Ev Evan Williams. And Evan Williams is a bourbon. And the Evan Williams bourbon was named after my great, 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 you know, uncle Evan Williams. And he was uh, he was one of the first like corn whiskey distillers in the area. And Evan Williams, the bourbon, has no real affiliation with him other than this guy is in the Kentucky Historic Records, so they just took the they name. The same. <laughs> yeah, so I, sh I should go back there and visit the distillery and have a lawsuit, and at least demand <laughs> some, some bourbon or do something. At least get a case of bourbon or something, yeah. It's something, yeah, exactly. Well, see, my, see, my, my kids are adopted, and... Um, my daughter, uh, her family, I've traced her family all the way back to England and she, and, and her, you know, her, her birth father, I, I, he, he, he died very, very young. I mean, he died, she did get to meet him, but he died maybe two years after she met him, maybe four years ago, five years ago. Um, but his family, I was able to get way, way back and she's actually a distant cousin of princess princess diana through the dispenser family okay. and uh, her um she's a direct descendant of daniel boone wow. and a direct descendant of captain morgan the pirate oh wow yeah so so like you said you know when if you if you if you're able to make that connection uh it's it's pretty cool some of the people that i found and uh i also found that there were um three i think it was three brothers from italy the bassano brothers uh they were musicians and they went to england and they were court musicians for henry the eighth oh wow and they stayed there so yep. she's got italian you know great 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 grandfathers uh because they married obviously english women right. and it was really incredible to be able to you know be able to trace trace her back to some Italian family from, uh, I, I guess they were from, uh, I think they were originally from Venice, I want to say. Okay. Um, but, you know, it is, it is easier to your point. It is a little bit easier in the States because especially Revolutionary War, Civil War, you could find, you know, you could find some good records on them. Uh, so I'm going to assume, because you, you said your father grew up in, on the West Coast, yeah? So did yeah, the family kind of just trek across? Yeah, well, no, uh, he was born in uh, Tacoma, Washington, and he was, uh, you know, they were like relatively poor people, you know, like, you know, pretty um, low, lower income type, you know, situation, like just trying to make ends meet, which is not, you know, unlikely for, you know, people of that, you know, depression mm -hmm. era type, you know, family. So, uh but it is, so nobody, no one came across. They all stayed there. And as a matter of fact, even stayed in like the same town or, you know, one town over. But here's the funny thing is I got um, through Ancestry, which I have no business affiliation with Ancestry, but I, I think they're great. I mean, I yeah. think their algorithms and stuff are really terrific. So anyway, one of uh, my father's sister's uh 
I guess it'd be her granddaughter, um, she did the DNA. And so she found me showing up as like a second cousin and her last name now was Hunstock. So she contacted me and I, I didn't know of those people. So I, I knew immediately like who that was. And uh, so I was able to fill in everything. And her dad uh, is David Hunstock. And he was, he was like my dad's favorite, like nephew, this guy, for whatever wow. reason. And uh, so they told me he was having an 80th birthday a couple of years ago. So, so I actually went there for the 80th birthday, paid for everything, rented out a restaurant, and he didn't know I was coming. Now we had spoken on the phone a couple of times, so he was thrilled and you know that that we're still in touch. So I walk up behind him and I put a photo in front of him of my dad from like when my dad was younger. And I said, Do you know who that is? And he looks at it, looks at me. He goes, Yeah. And I said, Do you know who I am? And he shook his head, No. I said, I'm I'm Stevie. Um, I'm Tom's son. And oh man, it was wow, that's so nice. Spectacular. Yeah. 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 yeah it was yeah. really spec. So now I'm like heavily, I'm like really in touch with these people now. Like we're, you know, we correspond and Facebook and Messenger and talk on the phone and and so it's reawakened a side of the family that we were really um cut off from yeah and and you know because like back then like my parents were not you know they were i wouldn't say poor but maybe like a level over poor and so they couldn't like hop on the plane or even make a, a long phone call you know my dad was a factory worker you know so he couldn't spend you know money on a so so it's easy to lose touch and that's why many of these italian families that came over you know in the turn of the century they basically had to cut ties. Maybe they would go back and forth, maybe for the first couple of years, but then that was it. Then everything faded away because they just didn't have the money to make the trips or, you know, send letters and people just sort of fade away. So that's why I was so thrilled. And I know my grandparents would be very proud of me that I was able to reconnect with their their villages where there was no contact for like 120 years i know they'd be they'd be thrilled with that so i was happy to do it yeah and you know steve what what amazes me is that how, how few people see the value in all of this i mean to me it's the same thing you know when i make a, a connection i mean you know to connect with somebody in italy that's that's you know second third fourth cousin whatever to me it's helping you figure out who you are and where you right. came from and and so few people like you know get it you know what i mean right oh, exactly <laughs> yeah yeah no like when you were talking about some of the um you know your ancestors who were famous people and i have i could tell you the same stories and when um people come over and i tell them these stories they just glaze over. And, and I, I think they think that we're lying, you know, that we're making all this stuff up or it's not real. They laugh. They, they think it, I think they think it's funny that I believe this. They think I'm nuts, but the reality is they all would have the same kind of stories and the same connections. It, the only difference is you and I have spent thousands of hours researching this stuff and putting it into a database where they haven't done anything. And so we know what these connections are. And, um, yeah, you know, and I'm, 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 and I'm working, I'm getting there. I'm working on a book and then thankfully I have a, somebody who's a, a, a good friend of mine, his daughter is helping me edit it, but I've been going through, uh, because I can, and because of these, some of these noble families that I'm going through it. And it's, these are stories that I've never heard before. You know, you can't just find these things in the Encyclopedia Britannica, but you know, who is, I give you a perfect example of one thing I found. There's one family for five generations, they were the, uh, the justice quote unquote executioner. So 
for a for hundred years, you know, the father, the son, the grandson, the great grandson, they all held this title. And I don't think they were the guy who actually, you know, hung some, I think they were the person who the king set off with his head and they signed the paper. But that's, in, you know, that to me is just incredible yeah. to find out the history of these people. And maybe it's just because I was always a history nut in school. Right. And I find it fascinating, but yeah, uh, yeah, I have the same thing. I, I, I talk to people and they just look at me. I come out of my mind. Like, why do you care? You know? Yeah. So I, I got one more, one story. Uh, this is on my wife's side, which kind of illustrates your point a little bit. So my wife came from, uh, you know, a Southern girl. Uh, mother was from Alabama. Mother and father from Alabama. Um, really like pretty poor people. These are very poor people. And she, so I'm, I started doing her genealogy and she has a great grandmother by the name of Amanda Carmen, C-A-R-M-O-N. And one of the interesting things with ancestry, I'm sure you know, is that if you tap into somebody who is a descendant of a famous person, you may find that person in many other genealogy databases and mm-hmm. you basically get cross references from people that are researching that family line so sure enough this amanda carmen who was born in sand mountain alabama i mean like freaking <laughs> dirt poor okay so she is the direct descendants of john carmen who came over in the 1600s and whose best friend was Robert Fordham of Fordham University oh. fame in New York. And they actually founded Hempstead, Long Island. They actually purchased Hempstead, Long Island from the Indians. So this is a, this is a direct descendant, this woman. And I have, uh, because Carmen was such a famous name, there must be 30 other people uh, who have done years and years and years and years of research. So I have everything documented here. And uh, John Carmen, his family goes back to the Do- Domesday Book in England, you know, from the year 1000 when King Edward did the survey of every livestock and every mm-hmm. everything of value in the Kingdom of England. And that family dates back to the Domesday Book and also had Carmen's, like his son, of the doomsday book guy uh, fought in the, like the first crusades. So, you know, here I am with my wife and her sisters who think they just came from obscure poverty stricken people who, you know, just peasant type people. And, you know, and here I've opened up this golden book of information on just how, uh, uh, how noteworthy their family lineage is. Yeah, I, I'm gonna have to check my ex-wife's uh, tree because she, her family, she, she's some of her descendants are from the Wright family, um, yep. and they were big on Long Island. They own farms in yep. in Hempstead, Flushing, uh, okay. places like that. So it's quite possible there's a connection there somewhere. Yeah, and uh, she has some English roots like that. And then she also has some, um, you know, Dutch roots. And I found out that her, I guess the third or fourth great grandfather, um, he owned Rikers Island. Oh, wow. It was the Ricken family, uh, or, you know, Van Ricken, whatever it was. Uh, yeah. And, and they actually, they sold Rikers Island to New York city in something like, I don't know, 1850, 1860, something like that. Um, wow. So, uh, yeah, you're you're right. You know, once you start drilling into it, you do find those those other crazy connections around it. That, that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna have to check and see if she's got any Carmens in in her tree. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I found a great guy. His name is Kai White. He's a. Uh, it's probably probably I guess probably about seventy five. I guess he is West Point graduate. Really nice guy, and he's. Uh, he's an expert on not only revolutionary and civil war, be, but tracing back those people back to the to England. Uh, right. And he makes some amazing charts uh, to, to go along with that. Well, 
I really, really appreciate the time, Steve. This has been sure. uh, a lot of fun. Um, My pleasure. Yeah. I love talking about this crap, as you can understand. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> so even though even though there's a lot of people don't understand, we all get it. So we're in the we're in the uh, the elite, let's say. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks again, and take care.